Uh, one lecture in this course. Uh, welcome and let's make a, a good start by um, welcoming you and and I, I just want to basically run through today what it is you need to know if you're going to do a good job with this assignment. I'm assuming that's why you're here. It's, you know, it's something that um, you can read about on the course website, but there's probably some questions that you might have. There's also uh, some information that uh, isn't on the website that would be also helpful, I think, and that is to give you some contextual information about this course and about how it works and why we have it and, yeah, various things like that, which would help you, I think, to to make more sense of it, perhaps see more value in it. We've been uh, doing this course for the last 20 years, uh, but for the last 10 years, the uh, Computer Society, the ACS, has had a requirement on us to teach ethics in our programs so that uh, we meet their requirements for accreditation so that you are then eligible to join the ACS uh, as and when you, you want to do that. And I would recommend that you do it because the ACS is a pretty good organisation, well worth looking at. But we were doing it long before the ACS said we had to, and that's because it was recognised long ago that being a technologist is about more than just knowing how to do the technical side of things. Knowing how to program, hey, that's a given. Employers uh, assume that if you've got a degree, then you are able to program, that you have that competency. If you listen to what the uh, industry body people say, they all say this again and again, year after year. What they want in their, in their organisations are people who know how to do the soft skills as well as the hard skills of technical programming and so forth. And those soft skills include ethics, basically. So ethics is really uh, knowing what to do in a difficult situation that has no obvious solution to a problem. It happens in organisations almost always in the context of your working life and you, you, you're at a place and your employer says, OK, I want you to do this and uh, it may or may not be lawful or ethical to do that. Now, I hasten to add that most employers are ethical and lawful. The great majority are, but there are definitely some that aren't. Those are the ones that operate in the grey zone between what is ethical and what is legal in the world. And sometimes they skate over into the illegal side of things. Why? Because they can, because they know they can get away with it. Because you don't automatically get prosecuted if you commit an illegal act. I know that sounds strange, but it's true. You have to have done something serious enough to warrant spending tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, taking something to court, paying barristers, all of that. So unethical companies know that they can get away with a certain amount of illegality. And actually, there, there is a fair amount that most, many of them do get away with, and it's really not very good. However, uh, what I would say is that the number of organisations that are doing that are, are much less these days than they used to be. I think that's for a, a few reasons. I think that's because with um, social media and with uh, the growing connectedness of the world, it's getting much easier for news of these sorts of things to get out there in the world. Organisations are careful to guard their reputation, so if there's a possibility that their reputation will be harmed, then they often will be restrained in doing something that maybe 10 or 15 years ago they would have done. So what sort of things am I talking about here? Well, uh, how about 
taking on uh, interns and using them up for six or more months without paying them a cent, uh, telling them that, uh, you know, this will look good on your CV, so you're getting something out of this. Uh, I know quite a few organisations that used to do that. don't know if they still do, but uh, I remember them doing that. And when somebody finally says, oh, I've had enough, I'm going, they say, yeah, okay, thanks, see ya, bye. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. And then they hire a, another one, you know, the following Monday, and it's business as usual. Those companies rely on free labour in order to survive. That's unethical. They shouldn't be doing it, but they can because there's no one to stop them. Uh, another one that they sometimes do is write uh, a product, write a, a software program, knowing that it is not finished, knowing that it's got defects, but deploying it in the customer's site and then waiting for the customer to tell them about the problems that they know are already there. And then saying to the customer, oh, I wonder what you did to cause that. Uh, of course, we'll fix it for you, but it will cost you. And they then fix it for an inflated cost. It shouldn't have been there in the first place. Uh, and then they get paid a third time by imposing a uh, annual support agreement on that customer. So those sorts of things used to be rife in the uh, IT industry, but they're less rife now. There's an old saying in uh, that, there's an old saying that goes something like, with morals, laws are unnecessary. Without morals, laws are unenforceable. With morals or ethics, laws are unnecessary. Without ethics, laws are unenforceable. That's a truism, really, because, you know, honest people want to do the right thing. And uh, the law is there to just sort of, uh, you know, address some of the more extreme cases. But most people want to do the right thing, and they do do the right thing. But if somebody's completely uh, unscrupulous, then they'll find a way around the law, and the law will be unenforceable in that case. So here you are, your technologists who, when you're out, in fact, probably even now, you're capable of producing technology products that have great power, that have the potential to influence the world in significant ways. That gives you power. And unless you have a sense of responsibility about what you're doing, then the temptation might well be there to do something that you shouldn't. Now, I hasten to add that I give everybody here credit for having ethical standards. The fact that we're making you do this course is not a reflection on a perceived lack of morals or ethics. Uh, it's simply that nobody has got a perfect set of morals and Nobody has probably, well, if you've already done the ACS uh, code of conduct, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then, um, you know, that's great, but you still need to do this course because there's a lot more to it than just the ACS stuff. And uh, hopefully you'll come out of this course with a pretty broad understanding of what morality is. And, you know, I use the word morality and ethics interchangeably because... Uh, ethics is really just the branch of philosophy that deals with morality. So the two, it's really just the same thing. But the problem, one of the big problems that uh, we run into with a course like this is that we have students from all over the world, all over the place, and uh, moral standards differ from place to place. They are different because the morals are have grown out of and are an expression of the culture of that country. And every country has its own culture and uh, there are going to be differences. So I can't just teach you what is moral to do in Australia because, you know, well, for obvious reasons. So 
I need to get down to some sort of bedrock, some kind of underlying truth that is there beneath all, co uh, all morality, regardless of culture. <clears throat> and that's what I've tried to do. It was no easy thing because what was necessary was to have a look at the broadest number of uh, cultures, well, religions, actually, because I know religion is a contentious thing, but one of the things that religion does is, is codify uh, moral conduct. And uh, I looked at the seven or eight major religions in the world and looked at what their basic tenets were, wrote them all down in a table and uh, basically so, well, what exactly is common here? Are there, is there commonality? And, well, yes, there is. There is, in fact. And that's good news because what it means for us is that if we teach that, you've got something as close to a universal human truth as it's possible to get. It was true a 1,000 years ago. It'll be true in a 1,000 years from now. So, for example, I won't go through them all, it's, it's in the textbook, but, uh, for example, every religion has got some version of the do to others what you would have them do to you. Do to others what you would have them do to you. And it is expressed in different terms, of course, because each one expresses things in the way that is appropriate for that cultural uh, and that that historic period. But, you know, if you can get down underneath the words and, and see what's actually being said there, you can see that it is actually the same thing. And in many cases, it's pretty obviously the same thing. But, you know, it's not just a religion saying this. Uh, there is, there is uh, you know, in physics, I think it's Newton's second law, is it, that every action has an equal and opposite reaction? I mean, essentially, what we do to the world is what gets done back to us. It may not be straight away, may not be as mechanistic as two billiard balls hitting each other, but there is a connection, there is a causal link, there is a linkage between cause and effect. And, uh, you know, it's... It's there. So that is, that is an example of what I'm talking about, and that's what I've tried to put into this course. I think it's really handy, actually, to know things that don't have a use-by date. You know, some, some technology, a lot of technology that you learn about does have a use-by date, and that's unavoidable. It's the nature of the business, but there are some things in human terms that never change, and that's what we're trying to give you here. So, honestly, you won't find a course like this in any other Australian university, because I've looked, uh, because uh, it's just too big and too difficult a thing to do, but I've worked this up over the last 10 years, and uh, basically, I think it's a useful thing to know. And here is an example of what I was just talking about, about doing as I would be done by. What I've put in is the same information that I wish somebody had told me when I was sitting where you are now. So I'm doing to you as I would have wanted to have been done by, but wasn't. Uh, too bad, you know, I had to figure it out for myself. That was all right. But, uh, you know, looking back, I realise it would have helped me a lot to know this, I wouldn't have wasted anything like so much time in my 20s and 30s as I did. I could have saved myself that, and uh, you can save yourself time as well. So, you know, it's an investment in your future. It isn't just about what to do in the computing world. It is about uh, having a framework of uh, a mindset that you live by. Um, okay, so going beyond that, what we will then try to do with this course is outline those universal principles so that you have an understanding of them and can apply them. Now, I'm not going to prescribe any particular way of going about the implementation of these ideas. 
That simply doesn't work. That prescriptive approach just doesn't work. You have to allow intelligent people the, f the f freedom and flexibility to, f to work out their own way of doing these things. So it requires reflection on the principles and asking yourself, well, how am I going to do this? How can this be implemented? And if I had to boil it down to a very simple proposition, it would be this. The art and science and practice of ethical conduct really comes down to cultivating enough awareness and insight so that you can see the cause and effect links between what you did in the past and where you are now, how it is that what you did back then has resulted in you being here now in the circumstances you are in, and then, importantly, by extension, what do you have to do now in order to create the circumstances of the future that you want to get to? Now, that is a very human thing to be doing. No other creature on this planet even comes close to that level of cognition. And in fact, there's a lot of people out there in the world who d never think about that stuff. You know, they just go along through life doing what they've always done, wondering why the same things keep happening to them, etc. So it is that awareness of those cause and effect links. And when you achieve that awareness, it, it is difficult. It is not always obvious where those links are. You, sometimes you have to look really closely and think about it. And it brings, it brings us to the inevitable uh, condition in order to do this. You need to have a mindset which takes responsibility for your own life takes responsibility for the situation you are in. In other words, whatever your circumstances are now, you take responsibility for having got yourself here. Now, maybe you let someone else make decisions for you and that's what's resulted in being here, but that's also a decision on your part to allow someone else to decide. You are where you are through your own actions. And uh, that is difficult enough because we live in a, in a society that encourages victimhood, encourages people to not take responsibility, to blame other people for what happens. And it's all very comforting. But what does it do? It actually takes away that person's power to be an autonomous individual. And that's the worst thing that any, any of us could really do. So if you take responsibility and you look for those cause and effect links, then you empower yourself like no other, like no other way can. Absolutely. And it allows you to move forwards in the direction that you want to go in a way that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do if you didn't take responsibility, if you didn't see those cause and effect links and so on. Now, I could give you dozens of examples of how that could work. I don't have time, and it, you know, it's dozens of examples. And some of them, people have said, you know, I've said, I, I caused that to happen. And I said, no, you didn't. That's just, you know, a random thing. You know, you, you shouldn't take that on yourself. But I could see. So the one really graphic example that I will give you is uh, I was in a car accident uh, a while back and um, it was a camper van, basically, and it was an old camper van and it wouldn't start in the mornings. Every morning it wouldn't start. We had to roll start it. And, you know, it just really bugged me that this thing wouldn't start. And I kept thinking to myself, geez, I'd like to just give this thing a boot up the ass and just get it going. You know, I was mad at it. And every morning for weeks, like four or five weeks, I thought this. And then one morning, same thing was happening. Uh, and the next thing we knew, we were propelled into, <laughs> like, 
in the most uh, horrendous way. We were rear-ended by a truck going about 80 kilometres an hour. We were stationary on the hard shoulder of a highway, hit from behind by a truck going 80 kilometres an hour. The driver had fallen asleep. Boom. And, uh, you know, I knew what had happened and I thought, you know, I'm going to die now. I thought uh, I couldn't see any way out of it. I thought that this truck was going to roll right over the top of us and we were both going to die in a horrible sort of mangled metal mess. I really did. You know, I, I could not imagine any other outcome. It just seemed inevitable. But the fact was, it knocked us clear of the truck. He would have woken up and jammed on his brakes. So we were propelling forward and we were going off the road into a ditch, into a muddy ditch. Now, you know, the cop said, not your fault in the least. All his fault. He was probably, you know, been taking speed or something. You know, it, we were blameless in a legal sense. But then I realised that, you know, what had happened was exactly what I had been wanting to happen uh, for weeks. And I had created that situation. Now, fortunately, I mean, obviously, I didn't get killed and neither did my wife. And we were relatively unhurt by this, even though it was... Anyway, but, uh, you know, so I've said that to people and they said, you shouldn't do that. You, you know, that's crazy. That's not your fault. But I could see the linkage. It was obvious. I mean, I'd, I'd sort of thought this over and over. So that's just one example. When you can um, come to the situation where you can actually see the cause and effect links and you don't indulge in, you know, blaming others, uh, then you will become very, uh, well, as an almost byproduct, you will become ethical. Um, and it will allow you to be very effective in your career and in all sorts of other ways as well. Now, what I've just told you is in no way inconsistent with what is orthodox moral philosophy. It's just I've expressed it in my own terms, but that principle is very much a recognised principle and uh, one that it would be very difficult for anyone to refute because it's been around for a very long time. OK, so with the course, uh, we give you all that extra information, but we also uh, need to assess it. And we have the case study which you then are required to do an uh, analysis on using the ethical decision model. Now, that's the heart of it. The assignment is really a single assignment in two parts. I say it's single because it's one big case study divided into two, but one big case study, and you're doing the same thing for both parts. The same process is being applied in both cases. So you do the first part, which is worth 40%, 40 marks. You get a result and feedback on that, and then you do the second part, which is 60 marks. So you learn something and you hopefully do it better the second time. I would add also that I am certainly not here to penalise people. What I would like to do is give everybody a fair go and uh, to give you a good mark and basically not look to take marks away but look to give people marks that they deserve. So I really don't want this to be seen as an adversarial process. I know it's very easy to fall into that with university lecturers, you know. It can be an adversarial situation. It really doesn't work very well that way because I want you to see me as someone well-intentioned towards you, not someone looking to do you harm. And I do want to, you know, do benefit here. So uh, essentially, we'll look to mark you fairly and mark you well. We have the same person doing all of the marking across both campuses, across the undergrad course and the postgrad course. It's not me. And uh, my marker has been doing the marking for me for years and years and she knows exactly how to do it and she's accurate. She's fantastic at this. So 
you know, and I tell it to mark people generously. Uh, so you should like your results, but even if you don't, you can console yourself with the thought that it is consistent across everybody. At Nathan the other day, someone said to me, why is the uh, master's course overall, why is it 7,000 words all up and, and the undergrad only five and a half? That seems very unfair to me. Uh, no one's ever asked me that before because it has always seemed obvious. Um, the way the university sees these things is that a master's degree is a higher degree than a bachelor's degree and calls for a more difficult approach, basically. So that's it, and that's the university's rule, in case you were wondering. So, the, uh, so let's get into some nitty-gritty then. Now, I, <laughs> I've put a lot of information on, on here. If you've been to the Learning at Griffiths site, there's a lot. I know there is. It takes a long time to read it all even longer to understand it. But it's all there because people have asked me these things over the years, you know, down to really nitty-gritty things. Should I write in the first person? Uh, you know, things like that. And, uh, you know, so I've put, I've put everything like that in there. I have also created videos. I've put up uh, examples of earlier assignments that have done really well and uh, essentially tried to give people all of the information that they need to actually understand what's going on. People sometimes email me and say, I just don't understand what you want me to do here. Uh, you know, tell me what to do. And I can't and I won't because, I mean, this is basically about getting you to tell me what you would do in this situation, not me telling you what to say and then you saying it back to me. Um, and there's no reason why anybody should say that or think that if you take the time to read this information. Um, what, uh, what really will... Okay, what, what determines your mark is the depth of analysis that you're able to perform. Basically just that. Depth of analysis. So in these case studies, in these case studies you've got multiple ethical issues that uh, you need to identify. And uh, some of them are pretty obvious, others are not so obvious. And People who really drill down and look closely can find a lot more issues than somebody who just does a cursory look. So that's what will get you the marks, is how deep you've gone, and the measure of that is how many issues you were able to identify. How many issues? So the issues can be categorised against those environments. So it could be legal, it could be professional, it could be employment, etc. Now, some issues, not all of them, but some of them are applicable to more than one category. So if they are, you should definitely list them in those other categories. So list everything that you can see. But uh, the marker will spot if, you know, if, if something's been listed and it's not really, it's just padding it out. But that's, um, that's how somebody can get right up and get a lot of issues, is by seeing where they overlap. You know, because, I mean, in life, it's, things are, ne uh, are usually not just cut and dried. Yes? Did you report that issue twice, or would you just report it once and say it's public? Uh, well, no, you do it twice, and you'd, um, you know, in, in the template, there's sections for each of the... So you put, put it once in that one section and then again down there. So, yeah, yeah, basically it's, um, it's treated as slightly like a separate issue if it's in that separate category. Uh, but not everything is like that, of course. It's, um, some things are just a single category. Another important point to remember is that uh, 
when you come to prioritise things, the hard and fast rule is that the legal environment takes precedent over everything. And that is because you can't break the law. That's the, that's the ultimate point. But you might say, well, hang on, what about the professional environment? Doesn't that, isn't that really important? Well, yes, it is, but the, it's not a problem because there is nothing said in the legal sense that is going to contradict what is said in the professional sense. You know, the ACS, no professional body is going to advocate doing anything illegal. So the two things are always going to harmonise. Maybe that begs the question, well, why even have the two things? Why not just combine them? Well, that's because <clears throat> there are a lot more professional issues than there are legal issues. The law is pretty complex, but, you know, the law has trouble keeping up with the pace of technological change, and there's quite a few issues in the technology world that the legal world are struggling to catch up with. You know, so there, there are going to be issues that are professional, not mentioned in the legal. Next down, you've got the employment uh, environment, and that's almost always where the trouble comes. Almost always. Your employer asking you, ordering you, getting you to do something that is questionable. Now, you might... You know, you might think to yourself, geez, I'm not very comfortable doing this, but they're telling me I have to do it. There is... Uh, the ACS have got a service that you can talk to uh, about such things, uh, you know, if you are uncomfortable with what's going on. Now, they might either say, yeah, I mean, I appreciate you've got your reservations, but it's not actually illegal or it's not even unprofessional or it might be coming close, but, you know, they'll talk, talk about it. Or they might say, yeah, that is a problem, um, you know, then it moves to the next stage of, I think it goes that the ACS approaches the, the organisation and says, you know, this. Let me be quite clear about the business of whistleblowing. Um, it's seen as a virtuous thing by many people. Uh, and I'm not saying that in a, an extreme situation, as a last resort, you wouldn't resort to it. But it should only ever be the last resort for, the ver for various reasons. Is that, well, firstly, legally, you are bound not to do that because when you go work for someone, you sign an employment contract and it specifically says that you will not talk about anything to do with your work to a third party, i.e. the newspaper or anyone else, uh, without the written permission of the employer. And there are various fairly stiff legal penalties uh, for people who do. So you could get, you could get taken to court. Secondly, uh, it's considered very unprofessional uh, to do that because you have an obligation to your employer of confidentiality and that doesn't just include when you agree with what it is they're doing. You're obliged across the board to be, you know, to maintain that confidentiality. And people who don't tend to become unemployable, at least in that city, if not that country, because word gets around, it always does. People talk. And, uh, you know, in extreme situations, people can die, people get killed. Uh, so Edward Snowden is reckoned to have caused, directly caused, the deaths of several hundred people around the world because his revelations um, revealed them to be intelligence operatives in some foreign country Next thing you know, they're arrested and never seen again. So, you know, it's tempting, but the consequences of not having the correct perspective, you know, those sorts of decisions need to be made by people who've got a much bigger picture view of the world. So, anyway, look, uh, do talk to the ACS if you find yourself in that situation.
So I'll get you to put the uh, assignment into the um, assignment submission point here. That stays open for a week after the due date. Uh, it stays open and uh, then it closes because that's when the marks are released. Uh, you can't simultaneously keep the submission point open and release the marks. When you release the marks, the, it closes automatically. So we try for a week turnaround on the marking and uh, you can expect to get your marks back and feedback back uh, by the following Friday. If you are submitting late, still put it in through there. It'll be open. The marking workflow, like we've got about 450 students enrolled in this course across campuses and undergrad, postgrad. And uh, we've got a, a marking workflow that works really well at that sort of bulk level. People uh, wanting special sort of, you know, with special submissions, submitting late without a penalty, for example, uh, is going to mess that up. So if you are submitting late and you've got a good reason to, you know, you've got a medical certificate or something, then uh, you need to, uh, you will get the penalty in the first instance. You will then um, contact me and remind me uh, about the extension and I will amend your mark. That's, that's the only way it can really work in a, in a practical sense. Okay, so uh, that'll be that. The um, feedback, here is a big important area, you know. Feedback is so important with assignments. And I have uh, done a little research project that has looked at the seven key features of really good feedback. And what I noticed when I was doing the marking years ago that uh, it took me, well, weeks and weeks for one thing, and I found that I was um, saying much the same thing over and over again because, you know, people do, do much the same things in their assignments and the same advice applies over and over again. So it occurred to me that um, if I put together a library of comments that were relevant to each and every situation that, you know, we see in the assignment and that the marker puts that in, that only takes them a second to do, but it is absolutely keyed to your work. So it is still relevant. There, there is uh, an opinion among some students that unless the, the feedback has been written especially for someone, then it's of little use. Well, that's really not the case. You can make such uh, feedback really quite useful. Now, doing it this way means you get upwards of 500 words or so of feedback, whereas before you might only get 100 words or 200 words or something like that. And the feedback you get is keyed to those seven principles. I address each one of those principles so that what you end up with is some pretty useful information. Now, it doesn't matter that your friend over there got much the same sort of comments because it's relevant to them as well. So, you know, hopefully you can see the point in doing it this way. It allows us to get you the information sooner. Uh, but I realise that there are people who want more information than just that, and that's fine too. You can ask me to give more detailed uh, feedback, which I will do. Uh, so, you know, that's, most people are happy with that level of feedback, but the ones who, you know, want more can get more. So no one should go without, no one should go with less than they are happy with. So, the, um, so we've got a lot of information here and various examples, exemplars. Let me just go now for a second to the case study here. The content of this, I realise, you know, I, I write these things and it ends up sounding a bit kind of like a bad soap opera, but it's, 
it is actually pretty accurate for the sorts of things that goes on. The content of this comes from several sources, either from my own experience in the IT industry, I worked in the industry for 15 years and I saw things, uh, and my experience or uh, people who I know, friends, who've had things happen, or a third source from the ACS's little library of case study material. So it's all, you know, none of it is pie in the sky, you're never likely to see it. These are the sorts of things that do tend to happen. And I mean, the principle is, if you've had a chance at uni to go through and figure out what to do, what would be the course of action to do with this sort of thing, then when it does, if and when it does happen to you in real life, in your work, you'll have a pretty good idea what to do about it. It probably seems pretty obvious to say this, but I do get asked. Uh, part one of the case study applies only to part one of the assignment, part two only to part two. Part two should not contain material from part one, except in, you know, just oblique references. It's basically, you know, you can't recycle text from part one into, into two, uh, which some people <laughs> try to do. Um, no, they're, they're both written from scratch, uh, and, and, you know, part one equals part one assignment, part two, part two of the assignment. You don't need to be a lawyer to do this assignment. Uh, if you're worried about not knowing what the case law is or what the various legislation applicable here, like the Privacy Act of 1988, for example, that's okay, you don't need to know that. You're not expected to know that. Uh, you basically just work on whatever legal knowledge you have. You know, you will know if something's illegal. You will have heard about it. Because that's what the media does, isn't it? It, it reports on people who break the law and that's educational for the rest of us. That tells the rest of us, if you do this, well, they'll probably come after you. So, you know, over time, you do get a pretty fair idea of what's legal and what's not. So that's the uh, case study. Now, I'll get you to use the assignment template. Almost everybody uses the template. Some people don't for some reason, but there's a good reason to use it, and that is it is structured in a way that is very helpful to you. It's just a plain old word template. And, uh, you know, so you see here you've got the various areas. Everything within angle brackets needs to be deleted afterwards. It's there simply as reference test, text just to explain to you what it is you, you need to do. Yes, they do, yeah. Yes, there is, and I'll, I'll talk about it. The second one's a little bit different from the first, pretty much the same, but there's a, a, a difference. I mean, it's really just, it, it's more helpful than anything. It, it shouldn't feel like a straitjacket because these are the points, this, this is the structure that will help you think clearly about the whole business and will help you do a better job. So you've got those things, and then you've got a table of prioritising, and then you'll just put them in, all the ones that you have identified. You'll put them in, and uh, if there's a related issue, you can put that in. Now, I don't really mind how you express all of this. That's up to you. There's no... You know, I, I often get email from people saying... I'm really not sure if I've said this right. You know, it's, uh, I'm worried that I've said it wrong. Don't worry, because it's really, you know, if you've seen the, the issue and you've described it and you've said what, is it, you know, what it is about it, et cetera, how it's prioritised, well, that's not, that's up to you how you do that. That's your opportunity to express yourself, and we won't... Um, 
you know, we won't mark you down for any little idiosyncrasies you might have in your English expression. <clears throat> so it's all pretty open-ended. And, you know, what, I, what we are looking for is, as I said, that depth of analysis. It's really just that. How, caref how well have you looked into it and can see what's actually going on? Now, just as a related issue, this is a very useful skill to have as an employability skill, I mean. Uh, I've, I read a, a really excellent book by a Harvard professor called Howard Gardner called Five Minds for the Future, all about what skills will people need in the future, in, in, the, in the employment market of the future. And the first one he mentions is exactly that. He says the, in, the ability to look deeply into something past the surface of it at what's actually going on underneath to perceive the, the truth of it. Now, this is not a new idea. This was something that Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher, said, you know, thousands of years ago, just that. He said, uh, ask yourself, what is this thing in itself and of itself? What is it for? You know, so <laughs> if you've seen that movie, Silence of the Lambs, uh, Hannibal Lecter actually quotes that to Agent Starling. Uh, makes it no less true. But essentially, you know, that's, that was acknowledgement that part of Lecter's diabolical insight into human nature was his ability to do exactly that, to look past surface appearances. So if you, if you acquire that skill and cultivate it and practice it, employers will value it highly. They will. Because too few people do it. And, uh, it, you know, it's something that can come in very handy. What Gardner then goes on to say just very quickly is... Once you've done it with one thing here, you do it with another thing here and maybe a third thing here. And once you know the truth of those three things, you mash them up and see what happens. And sometimes it'll be brilliant and fantastic and earth-shattering, but most of the time it won't be. But every creative person knows that that is the method that they have to use. And it might be only one time in 20 that they get a really workable idea, but that one workable idea has made the 19 previous completely worthwhile because that one good idea is brilliant. You know, we don't see the efforts that those people go through to get their brilliant ideas, but they have been through that process. So, you know, if you're going to do it, then you accept the fact that you are going to not succeed in, in a number of cases. All right. Next uh, point to make is with the second assignment, same first part, but down here, what have I learned from this course? Uh, just, if you know anything about this course, you'll know that the quizzes used to be assessed. 2% each quiz, 10 quizzes, 20% overall. The rules changed. Uh, the university changed the rules and the ACS have gotten very militant about this too. They say at third level courses and master's level courses, there can be no uninvigilated quizzes uh, at all. So I was supposed to have done that last, like before, and I didn't, and I got into all sorts of trouble for it. I just forgot to do it. And, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was a drama. So basically, we, we, we still have to assess whether or not you've read the textbook. So the practical way of doing this is to get you to write a summary of about 120 words of each of the chapters, modules in the book. It's pretty straightforward. I mean, you just have to read it and... And write that. So that's the uh, that is the that's that section. 
It's worth 20%, same as the quizzes, so if you don't do it, that 20% is lost. Uh, and if you are so inclined, you can just put a few final comments in. <laughs> Please be gentle. You know, sometimes people can be pretty rough in those sorts of areas, as, as in the course evaluations. Um, make it constructive. Uh, and if you did find something useful in the course, you know, tell us what it was, because if we know what's working, we can do more of it. Plus or minus 10% is the word limit, and the number of words applies to the, uh, everything after the table of contents and everything before the, uh, uh, the references, if you have any. Now, you're not required to look beyond the textbook for these assignments. You don't have to have a whole list of references, academic or otherwise. You're free to do that if you want to. You know, it wouldn't be bad if you did it might get you some extra credit, but uh, we don't make it a, an assessment criteria. So it's everything between the contents and the references. And I'm sure most of you know this already, but uh, you don't need to manually do the table of contents. You just right click on the table and select update field. It's not going to change because I haven't done anything, but uh, that's essentially the way to do it. We do get quite a few submitted that people have laboriously gone through and done their own table of contents. Not necessary. Okay, so uh, I'm not finished, but I'll ask, are there any questions so far about any of this? Yes? So regarding the references, yep. whenever we talk about something that might be from the textbook, do we have to explicitly reference No. It? I'm going to assume that's where it came from because, yeah. Someone else? I'm sorry, another question regarding. Yeah. Um, on the, I think it was the video or some of the text you said regarding the duplicate words, how do we check that? Because I've looked for the link, I couldn't really find it. Uh, duplicate words as in? Well, isn't it like 10% can't be duplicate text? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, so with um, Turn It In, it allows you to submit uh, every 24 hours, no, less than 24 hours, right up until the deadline. And at the deadline, like that, that then becomes one. And it will give you a report of how much duplicate text you've got. So if you find that, you know, you've got too much, then you can do something about it. But I've adjusted the parameters that we don't... We don't generally have that problem. It's only if somebody has, you know, used an essay from somewhere else <clears throat> and there's a lot of duplicate text in there. So it's not generally a problem anymore. Yeah. Uh, the other reason to not quote the case study is that it will show up as duplicate text. You won't be penalised for it, but, you know, it's not plagiarism, but it's still duplicate text. No, it, it isn't. That, that person was really keen. And I think they were a law student. Uh, they, you know, they, they emailed me before submission and said, I've done this. Is that going to be a problem? Um, and I said, no, not at all. And I, I made it as the example of because it was actually pretty useful information about the, pri I think it was the Privacy Act or something, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, so, no, you don't, you don't have to reference legal matters. So these examples here will show you the sorts of things that people have done to get a high distinction level result. And that's, uh, that's good to know. Obviously, it's based on a different um, case study but the way they've gone about it is something that you can learn from. And you'll see that they are quite different, actually, in the way that they've done it. It's quite a bit of difference. So, you know, that should reassure you that you've got plenty of scope to do things your way. 
So in the end, this is really about what you think. I want to, we want to see what it is you think about this. And you, you do not need to wonder whether or not we're going to disapprove of what you've said. If you've addressed yourself to the topic and done what you're supposed to do here, you will not be penalised for being a bit idiosyncratic, um, individualistic, etc., etc. OK, so that's hopefully going to reassure you a bit. Uh, the late penalties these days, the university in their wisdom have decided to lessen the penalty. It used to be 10% per day, now it's 5% per day. So uh, if, you, if you don't submit by the Friday night midnight, uh, but do submit sometime before midnight on Sunday, following Sunday, then you will have a 5% deduction. So if you were going to get, if you had, sorry, if you were going to get 20 marks, you now get 19 marks. If you submit before Monday uh, midnight, then that's 18 marks. Then, da, da, da. And at some point, I think it's five, six days after submission, it goes down to zero. But, uh, yeah, I mean, essentially, the weekend counts as one day. Just a point about, look, you're all advanced students, so you will know this already with Turnitin, that it gets really congested towards midnight on Fridays. Maybe I should make it a Thursday night. Uh, it would be a lot less. No, but it's Friday. Um, if you leave it to five minutes to midnight, the chances are server congestion will mean that it doesn't actually make it through into turn it in until sometime after midnight. So it's really, it, we go by when it actually arrives at turn it in, not when you started to submit. So basically, if you, if you submit it half an hour earlier, then there should be absolutely no problem. But what I would say is, please don't, please try to not leave it until then. Basically, the best way to approach this and the best way to get a really good mark in this assignment is to give yourself plenty of time and to allow uh, to finish it a good few days before the deadline, uh, ideally about a week before the deadline. Then you, then you just leave it for a couple of days and you come back to it and read it and you will see lots of ways that you can improve that because you know, you, you'll have got a certain objectivity about your work by that time. And you can always tell the students who do that because the standard of their work really goes up. Most people just submit a draft because that's all they've got time to do. And, you know, it could have, it might have been, it turned out to be a really good assignment if the person, if they had given themselves more time and spent a little bit more time on it afterwards. So that's, uh, you know, you probably already know this, you know, whether you do it or not is another thing. But if you, you know, I, I urge you to try this because, you know, if you want to get the best mark you can, that's definitely a good way to go about doing it. Uh, if, you know, I, I hate this whole sort of punitive thing about late penalties and stuff, but this is a course on professional practice and the IT industry really is very deadline driven, as you would probably know. So one of the assessment criteria we have for this course is, do you have the ability to do a piece of work, a complicated piece of work, and submit it by a deadline? That, that is a criteria. So. If, if you don't manage to do it and there's no particularly good reason for it, just that you left it to the last minute, that's, you know, that's not really going to fly. OK. Now, because this is a writing-intensive course, I would uh, encourage people, particularly those of you who don't have English as a first language, to use this service, the Smart Thinking, it's basically an online tutoring service that helps people with their writing. And you can send them drafts and they will give you 
feedback on those drafts. Now, with this course, it's just me teaching it. I do have a marker. The marker just marks. She doesn't do anything else. Um, and I don't really have time to tutor everybody up on, on writing. But the university does. And uh, so I would really recommend if you, you know, if you are at all inclined to make use of the tutorial. Nearly there. Okay, so that's basically everything that I wanted to cover. Um, I'm open for questions, anything at all. Anything at all? <laughs> Almost anything. <laughs> well, try me out. Ah, the new encryption laws. Yeah, I mean, basically, well, to be honest, I haven't looked very closely at it. I know that it's driven by an imperative that hackers are getting better and better and are using more and more sophisticated tools, AI tools, to um, beat existing encryption. Now, I mean, this is part of an ongoing cat and mouse game, isn't it? Of, and, uh, you know, there, there's no end to this, I don't think. It's just going to be more and more. Um, yeah. I mean, related to that would be legislation like the European Union has, the General Data Protection Regulations. The GDPR basically safeguards the rights, the privacy rights mainly, of people who they call data subjects. Uh, and there are all sorts of prescriptions about how and when and in what manner their personal information is processed, is, is accessed, collected, kept, what's done with it, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I, I, I don't know too much about encryption, but sorry. Anything else? Yes. Um, for the conclusion, should it be more like a like plan of action for each of the like individuals in the story or for the main character? Yeah, story? thank you. That's, that's a great point. I'm glad you mentioned that. I should have mentioned that in that conclusion, what you need to do is say what it is you would do in that situation and why. You know, what evidence do you have to support your proposed course of action. So yeah, that's basically it. You say, in consideration of all of the above, this is what I would do, and for the following reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. Someone else? So look, I, uh, I would just take this opportunity to wish you all the very best. Um, you are probably getting close to the end of your programs and uh, our, you know, we'll be moving out into the world soon. Uh, hopefully you'll have got something useful from this course. Uh, I think you will if you have an open mind with it and just uh, absorb it. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you have any further questions, you can either come down afterwards and talk to me or email me. Okay, that's it. Thank you.